Hello, welcome again to another session of Digital Slide Review and Sign Out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel. I'm coming to you from the campuses of the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center in Oklahoma City. Our case today is uh, a uh, remarkable uh, case, uh, not frequently encountered in GYN pathology. Um, the patient is a 63-year-old woman who had postmenopausal bleeding. Um, and thought to have carcinoma, perhaps involving her uterus and her ovaries, um, primarily due to the uh, massive uh, abdominal mass that was seen on CT. Uh, she was referred to this hospital uh, by an outside uh, institution uh, for a definitive management and further evaluation because this was more than they could uh, handle in a simple situation. As we can see from this CT scan, the mass is quite heterogeneous. Uh, it's got uh, some uh, uh, hypodense areas, some hyperdense areas, a variable uh, density, and it's certainly displacing many of the intra-abdominal and pelvic uh, organs. Um, so it's involving the, uh, the, the abdomen as well as the pelvis. Uh, so the patient was brought to surgery and uh, a representative sample of this was submitted by the GYN oncologist um, prior to proceeding with a more definitive evaluation to help guide their uh, treatment. Here's the uh, section submitted and sampled for frozen section. Um, hence, we have a little bit of frozen section artifact. You see some uh, ice crystals and so forth. But at low magnification, we can appreciate that this is uh, uh, not a usual epithelial tumor. Um, and it is a rather uh, cellular tumor uh, with these clusters of uh, more blue nuclei here, uh, and then some peripheral uh, tissue off uh, to the side here. As uh, we come to a little higher magnification, we can see that uh, the tumor doesn't have a very prominent vasculature, although there's some uh, medium-sized vessels scattered around. And it looks as though we have uh, little clusters and nests of lymphocytes here. <clears throat> We can look a little bit further and see that there's a, a fair degree of spindle cell type morphology to some of these uh, cells. Uh, we see a little bit of streaming, but no fascicular growth. And then here we can again see that there's a, a fair bit of inflammation associated with this with some plasma cells, uh, or plasma cytoid type cells. Uh, looking at the uh, periphery of this uh, lesion, um, see a little bit more fully what's going on here. Uh, we can see that the, the uh, spindle cell population is not highly cellular, it's not highly pleomorphic, uh, but it's certainly atypical. Um, as we come to the uh, periphery here, let me just move over here, uh, we can see that there's a border of uh, fatty tissue here. Uh, and looking at this a little bit more closely, uh, again, we don't see a huge degree of uh, atypia here, although there's a few atypical cells uh, in the fatty tissue here. So what should we be thinking about with uh, this sort of uh, morphology? Uh, well, of course, we can think about uh, pelvic and peritoneal spindle cell lesions that we might encounter. And of course, usually from a uh, gynecologic pathology standpoint, we might be thinking about uh, conventional and common things like leiomyomas or leiomyosarcomas, uh, but this lesion doesn't seem to have either of those features. Um, it doesn't have any of the vesicular type of growth that we would expect with that. We might think about endometrial stromal sarcomas, uh, both low and high grade, and certainly it's uh, fairly low uh, grade in terms of pleomorphism. Uh, but it doesn't have quite the vascular pattern and the inflammation would be unusual for a low-grade uh, endometrial stromal sarcoma. High-grade tumors, uh, of course, can have a variety of morphologies. Uh, spindle cell mesothelioma type lesions can certainly be uh, bulky, but uh, this pattern of involvement in forming a deep, large, single mass in the pelvis, pelvis and an abdominal cavity is uh, unusual. Some sex core tumors can have uh, Spindle cell morphology, granulosa cell tumors, or tolelytic tumors can have this sort of morphology. Uh, but this was not apparently directly involving the ovary um, and appeared to be more uh, pelvic and retroperitoneal. Uh, 
GI stromal tumors would be a consideration. Those certainly can arise uh, in extra uh, intestinal sites in the bladder, potentially in the, in the uh, deep soft tissues. Uh, similarly, fibromatosis and, and that can, lesion can have a fair degree of uh, inflammatory changes and certainly can have a sclerosing uh, spindle cell morphology. And then the soft tissue sarcoma is uh, most commonly uh, uh, liposarcoma, dedifferentiated type liposarcoma, uh, but also solitary uh, fibrous tumor could have uh, some of this morphology as well, uh, and then other lesions. So uh, how are we gonna sort this out? Uh, well, let's first uh, go to the uh, permanent uh, uh, sections. So here's the permanent section of our frozen section tissue. And again, we can see this scattered inflammatory pattern here. Uh, we can see uh, that again, it's a fairly cellular lesion and we'll uh, hone in on some of this uh, uh, tissue. We can see there's some degree of atypia now, uh, some pleomorphism to these nuclei. So we don't see necrosis uh, in this tumor um, and uh, mitoses, although present, are not uh, overwhelming. Uh, in terms of their prevalence. Uh, the vasculature is rather nondescript. Uh, the collagen is kind of ropey in between these spindle-shaped cells. And then we have these mast cells and maybe a few plasma cells and other inflammatory uh, lesions. Now, when I was a young trainee, a lesion like this would probably have been called a, an inflammatory uh, uh, MFH or uh, something of that sort. Um, but today, this uh, type of morphology, and particularly this uh, inflammatory process, um, seems to be fairly characteristic of uh, pelvic and peritoneal, sometimes very scrotal, uh, dedifferentiated liposarcomas in this location. So given that, we would want to do some further evaluations, maybe just a chemical workup, work and certainly uh, look for the characteristic uh, amplification of the MDM2. Um, so uh, we did some immunostains to rule out uh, solitary fibrous tumor, to rule out biomyosarcoma, to rule out GI stromal tumors, uh, and so forth. Uh, those were all negative. Neural differentiation was not evident. S100 was negative. We did do a P16, uh, which uh, can, be can be strongly positive, as indicated, not by HPV uh, involvement, but by uh, mutation of that uh, gene. Uh, and that was strongly positive in this tumor. And ultimately, uh, after a few weeks, a few days uh, wait, uh, the MDM2 uh, amplification was uh, reported by our uh, FISH laboratory. So dedifferentiated liposarcoma is a, a usually high grade uh, tumor that's uh, not particularly fatty forming but does arise in the setting of well-differentiated liposarcoma. Now, I didn't show you on the slides any border zones with uh, the morphology of well-differentiated liposarcoma. That's not always uh, recognizable. Uh, sometimes you have to search long and hard to find that. And in fact, in this particular case, only in uh, one uh, uh, margin did we find any evidence of uh, well-differentiated liposarcoma. As I've mentioned, it's characterized by uh, ring chromosome or a giant marker chromosome that has uh, information from the chromosome 12, the long arm 13 to 15. And this is what uh, results in amplification of MDM2. Uh, low grade differentiation is also posit possible. Um, and even occasionally you can have sort of heterologous uh, uh, elements or sort of smooth muscle differentiation or other low grade uh, uh, features. Uh, that's decidedly uncommon. Uh, the retroperitoneum is the most common site, but it can occur elsewhere. Not uh, frequently reported in subcutaneous tissues, but in deeper soft tissues. And probably about 10% of well-differentiated liposarcomas will develop uh, some measure of dedifferentiation. Slightly more common in males than in females, um, and not usually seen on the GYN oncology service, of course, uh, but uh, certainly something that if you're doing abdominal surgeries, uh, or seeing abdominal specimens from the GI tract and so forth, you'll see uh, this lesion. Uh, these tumors can be extremely bulky. Here's one example that was uh, nearly 70 uh, kilograms, uh, almost unbelievably large, and uh, literally required uh, a uh, 
more than more than four wheels to, to carry down to the to the laboratory. So our final sign out diagnosis today uh, for the frozen section, this would be appropriately signed out as a spindle cell tumor favor dedifferentiated liposarcoma given the inflammatory changes um, and the uh, degree of atypia noted. But uh, spindle cell tumor favor sarcoma, something of that sort would also certainly have been uh, adequate for uh, management uh, intraoperatively. And then our final diagnosis is dedifferentiated liposarcoma. It was uh, uh, FN and so the grade two uh, due to the morphology, but absence of uh, high mitotic rates or necrosis. And MDM2 uh, gene amplification was uh, uh, detected by FISH. So thank you for joining us today. We hope that that has uh, uh, provided some insight and uh, awareness for things that you may encounter. Uh, we welcome your comments below and certainly be interested in some of the challenging frozen sections of spindle cell tumors that you have come across and how you've uh, been able to resolve that. And of course, we always uh, encourage you to subscribe so that you'll uh, be tuned in for uh, 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 awareness of future releases on our channel. Uh, we always welcome your feedback and suggestions for future programs, things you, topics you'd like to see discussed, cases you'd like to see illustrated and uh, welcome your participation in that way. So until next time, uh, thanks so much for joining us.